Hello, I'm Lindley Gooden. I'd like to welcome you to Market Force and the Chartered Insurance Institute's Social Media and Insurance Webinar. As I'm sure you're all aware, social media allows the creation and exchange of user-generated content through a range of web-based applications and mobile technologies. It's changed substantially the way individuals, communities and organizations communicate. It takes on many forms, from internet forums and microblogs like Twitter to content communities like YouTube, as well as social networking sites such as Facebook. Well, people are increasingly looking for information and gathering news through these mostly free and accessible channels. And that clearly presents a great opportunity for insurers who are, are now starting to take the initiative and build their own social media presence that can provide new and exciting ways to interact with their customers. But, as I'm sure you're also aware, social media requires a very different approach and mindset. So today's consumers don't want to be talked at, but expect companies to listen, engage and respond. So today, we'll be looking at how companies can use social media across the entire insurance value chain, whether they want to create products and effectively market them, uh, manage the customer experience and handle claims, or to improve communications internally and with suppliers too. So we'll discuss some of the steps that the industry can take now to maximize the benefits of social media while steering clear of the potential pitfalls and barriers to successful implementation. So let's meet the, the panellists who've joined me today in the studio at the London Stock Exchange to uh, tackle some of these issues. First of all is David Williams. Hello, David. Hello. Uh, David is a chairman of the CII's underwriting faculty and managing director of underwriting and claims for Axis commercial lines business. David has over 20 years' experience in general insurance and is a, a regular speaker at conferences and other events on a variety of subjects, including customer experience, climate change, fraud, and now social media. Uh, David's an active Twitter user with the Username at AXA David W. Hurrah. Uh, next is uh, Nick Smith. Hello, Nick. Hello there. Uh, Nick is the uh, Director of Marketing Transformation at Accenture, one of the leading consultancies advising uh, on defining and delivering social media programs designed to create value via brand management, proposition development, and customer service. Nick has over 20 years' experience in advertising, marketing, and customer relationship management across various businesses and different sectors. Nick can also be found on Twitter at the hashtag, uh, at the at Nick X Smith. Trying to be very clear there, that seemed to work. And uh, thanks very much to Accenture for supporting today's webinar. Pleasure. Good to see you. Uh, next is Hannah Squirrel. Hello, Hannah. Hi. Uh, uh, Hannah is the Associate Director for Marketing and E-Commerce at Bennett's, which is the leading motorcycle insurance specialist and part of the BGL group too. Uh, Hannah is responsible for the development and delivery of Bennett's business plan across marketing, uh, e-commerce, aggregation and commercial, which is driving some very impressive growth, at least uh, partially uh, down to the use of social media. You can reach out and... and, and I say feel Hannah, but that's probably quite wrong, at uh, Hannah Squirrel, so do that. Uh, well, uh, over the next hour, we'll be looking at some of the challenges and opportunities for the insurance industry to create uh, value through the use of social media. We're bringing together a wide a cross-section of the industry today, and I uh, want to give you the opportunity to ask your questions and share your ideas too. As part of that, we'll be conducting a couple of very short poll questions throughout the webinar. You can find them on the right-hand side of your screen. I'll prompt you when they uh, come up, and we'll announce the results uh, throughout the webinar. Also, you can get involved uh, in the discussion at any time. Just go to Twitter, follow us at MarketForceInts, or use the hashtag SMIF. So let's get started. Well, first of all, let's start with you, David. Yep. Social media, how can it contribute and, and in some ways transform the way insurance is done? Uh, I, I think... It can tremendously transform the, the way we deal with uh, our customers. Yeah. And, and I think you mustn't just focus on one particular area. Yeah. Uh, all our customers, be they uh, personal lines or commercial, yeah. are in some way, shape or form using social media. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what we've got to do is we've got to understand it a bit more <coughs> than I think we do currently uh, and, and get actively involved because if not, we'll get left behind. Throughout the value chain? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, from a marketing perspective, how are you seeing things change? And, and uh, you know, what are the things that you think are really good about the way social media has helped you, you to grow the business? I think social media is becoming more and more prevalent in the industry, um, not just in terms of the number of social networks available for people to use, um, but in terms of the amount of time that people are spending interacting with them and engaging with them. It's very much a part of everyday life, certainly with the rise of the smartphone at the same time. Yeah. That's now. Nick, what about the future? I mean, let's jump ahead straight away at the start of the webinar. You know, how do you see this developing? Um, I think that uh, social media has been a catalyst for the way the consumer has changed how they engage with brands and yeah. business. So um, if you look forward, um, 
in the way that digital has become at the heart of the way that we uh, deliver customer service and we engage with consumers on, around products. Um, social media is changing the way that we need to think, the way that we need to behave, and, and, and actually we're leading to, to the world where, where we have the social enterprise, which is entirely different from, from where we are now. Um, very exciting, um, highly transparent and very dynamic. Mm. And you work with a lot of clients who are, who are either beginning to or already have adopted social media channels. Yeah. You know, <coughs> what, what are they learning? What are you learning? Well, what are you teaching? Yeah. I think that um, uh, most, I mean, all companies, I think mo most of our clients are um, uh, reasonably well advanced, but all companies, particularly in uh, the financial services sector, have been experimenting mm. around how they engage with customers through communications and how they use it as a service channel. I think the, uh, what we are observing is the, the, bringing, the coming together of, um, uh, of the business to, to define what their strategy looks like and yeah. uh, what tools and what uh, metrics they need to, uh, to harness this as a yeah. part of their overall business strategy. It is the coming together phase, of course. It has to continue to come together. You have to always update and respond yeah. very quickly. You know, how do you see, what extent do you see that social media will, in, will, will change the insurance sector, even in its approach? Uh, I think we're traditionally known as not being the most responsive, not being mm. the quickest uh, to change. We've seen that in all sorts of sectors in the past where um, issues have caused problems for insurance companies because other elements have, have responded to change, you know, be it socially or, or technologically, uh, much much uh, quicker than we have. So I, I think we need to respond to that. I think uh, we need to recognise that there's either a great opportunity there or there's a massive threat. Uh, and I think those companies that are successful are going to get their acts together. They're going to have a clear view as to what they want to do. I think it's mm. probably worse to just not be sure and be, you know, hanging back and waiting to see them being really clear mm. as to what you want to achieve and what you want to avoid through social media and, and mm. planning accordingly. Yeah. Nick, you were agreeing with that? Yeah, I mean, I think that we're seeing many organisations exploring the how, you know, what it is that we need to do, so testing stuff that... Um, uh, you discover it's, and there are so many options out there that you're discovering new technologies and new ways of doing things. I think they, they, they just build on your point. What's happening is people are now saying, "Well, why are we doing this?" Yeah. You know, not, "Wow, this is brilliant," but now, "Why are we doing this?" And bringing some kind of cohesion to to what the organisation is trying to achieve. Yeah. You know, we're trying to make money, of course. We're trying to engage with consumers. So, how yeah. um, is now becoming why? It might be interesting to know that uh, according to Market Forces' Future of General Insurance survey, uh, despite widespread belief in the growing prevalence of social media, uh, it appears that the industry may struggle to keep up with only uh, half the insurers surveyed uh, expecting their organisations to invest in social media as a channel over the next couple of years. Well, David, I mean, you know, investment is very, very important. I mean, uh, what do you think the mo most powerful arguments are for spending a bit of money, or is it necessary to? Well, no, that was going to be my point in terms of uh, when I think of, of things that have, have changed our business over the years, um, most of them have required substantial investment, you know, new IT systems, mm -hmm. big things like this. Social media, you can get involved yeah. without a major investment. Now, you know, the, the, the problem is that if uh, you get a response that you're not anticipating, you can end up with resource issues, yeah. but it's not something that needs um, a huge financial outlay up front. So you can play with it. I know that might sound a bit unprofessional, but you can, you can dabble, you can test. And I think some of the, you know, the best things that have happened over the years have come when people have um, you know, not had the, the full picture at the start of a project, yeah. and they've been able to tweak in a more dynamic way. And I think social media gives you that opportunity. And you you can get involved with no outlay at all. You just yeah. really need to allocate you know, some of the time of the right people mm. and just, you know, as I said earlier, make sure that you've got a degree of clarity as to what you're trying to achieve. It's difficult to do that in a large organisation or when you know, obviously compliance and regulation issues come into play, but, but Hannah, certainly you've, you've done the dabbling and how's it worked out? We have, and I totally echo David's point about resource implications as a consideration when you're thinking about going into this. Um, we started February with 265 Facebook fans, and literally we, we grew organically. We were just having a good time. This looks fun. Let's interact with the bikers and get some feedback. Um, we've now got 32,000 fans, and that in itself is a full-time job to make sure that's managed effectively. So it's definitely a consideration. Going into social media doesn't necessarily need to cost you a lot of money, but you do need to think about if it does take off in the ways ours has, how are you going to make sure you're managing that? Because those people do expect regular interaction at the end of the day. Absolutely. Well, we're going to get you involved now with uh, the first of our, our quick polls. You can vote uh, using the buttons to the right-hand side of the screen. So uh, having heard some initial thoughts from our panellists here, uh, we'd like to get your thoughts on a, on a question sent in by Misha Filio from G Capital Insurance Division. The question is, if you 
had to focus social media investment on one aspect of the customer lifecycle, what would it be? What's your first thing to focus it on? Acquisition, number one. Number two, servicing. Number three, loyalty and retention. Or number four, customer insight. Vote now and we'll have a look at the results in just a couple of minutes' time. Please do just vote to the right-hand side of the screen. Do it now. Uh, and in the meantime, just let's, let's ask your panel, um, which, you know, I guess one of the things we've just hinted upon is, is compliance, is regulation and so on. Very, very important to get... Well, very important to understand that the organisation will, will be worried about that, isn't it, David? Yeah, uh, we had a, a specific example recently where I tweeted that we'd sold our first commercial policy via Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, then there was a bit of a, an almost backlash in the trade press because nobody wanted to talk about it mm. uh, and suggestions that I jumped the gun. Uh, and I, I was very pleased that we had uh, taken advantage of, of you know, social media, but there wasn't a clear document which said that the uh, risk and compliance team had signed off the sales process. I mean, really all we'd done is responded to um, a customer inquiry and tweeted a web link where the sales process was fully signed off. But I think um, you have to get the risk and compliance team involved as appropriate because we're a highly regulated organisation, but you've got to make sure that that doesn't stifle the enthusiasm and uh, the opportunity that's out there. It's not, re- I mean, it's not really a sales channel, is it? It's more of a conversation, is, is, is that right, Nick? Well, I think that um, uh, social media is something that enhances all your other potential customer engagement. So even though, to your point, you, you weren't actually selling on social media, you were, you were providing a pointer to where the, uh, the customer might go. And I, I think that um, we need to think about social media as something that you can sell from, in inverted commas, um, uh, you, you're, you're servicing, but basically it's a dialogue channel. It's something that enhances your ability to have conversations with your customers. Mm. And for that, for a conversation to be real, you need compliance to be inside the tent, your legal department there with you, understanding that this is a different kind of channel and not approving every, uh, every interaction. Otherwise, you know, mm. social media stops being social media. It goes back to actually being old-fashioned direct marketing communications. Yeah. Well, let's, um, we have the poll answers in. Thanks very much for voting. Um, first of all, we had... Uh, which area would you focus on? Number one was acquisition. 40% on acquisition. 40% think acquisition is the, the place to put your money or your investment of time. Uh, number two, servicing is 21%. Uh, number three, loyalty, 33%. And customer insight is 11%. Now, is that the right... Hannah, what do you think? I mean, 40% for acquisition, 11% for customer insight. Uh, that seems as though the people want to grab the, grab the, the potential audience or and so on, on online, but not necessarily understand what they're doing. Is that, is that what they Really interesting how mm. that's come out, actually. 40% of acquisition, I'm very surprised about. Mm. Um, I think people will be expecting social media more around customer service, getting feedback, product mm. innovation, etc. Um, from a Bennett's perspective, we don't sell anything um, on social media. All of our activity, you'll never see a single sales message, yet actually our sales are at record levels, yeah. up 29% year on year. So yeah. I think it's more about engagement as opposed to focusing purely on acquisition messages. Yeah. Yeah. Before we go to the next section, just a quick answer for yeah. muting. I'm, I'm moderately surprised too. I, I think that um, the greatest um, uh, engagement through social media is around service delivery. So how, you, how can you enhance the delivery of um, uh, information or service um, to, to your clients or customers through social media? And, and um, I think it's the easiest place to start, um, and it's a journey-based piece of yeah. uh, activity. So um, uh, I, I'm surprised too, actually. Yeah. I think that acquisition is not where I'd start. Very good, very good, interesting answers there. Um, well, that set the scene for us nicely. Let's now talk in a bit more detail about the, the use and impact of social media. Firstly, at the policy buying stage. Uh, we all know that uh, customers use price comparison sites to look for insurance products, and uh, while the boom in aggregator sites could be described as the the distribution revolution of the last five years, social media looks to be the revolution of the next decade, which is happening now. 81% of insurers surveyed at for Market Forces Insurance Survey think that within the next five years, the majority of consumers will consult social media or online reviews before purchasing a new policy. Um, well, I mean, Hannah, you know, you've seen some of this, haven't you? What do you think, how important do you think recommendations reviews are? I think that's extremely important and I think over the last couple of years social media has basically facilitated that to happen uh, which has been a great thing for consumers and, and their buying habits. Um, we do six monthly brand tracking and recommendation is now the third reason that people will purchase mm. a policy with the first two being either price or value so more of the price aspects. Um, it's really important I think that if you're going into social media you've got the strength of your product and your customer service that people will endorse you because it is a double-edged sword. You're working in a, com- in a community 
obviously of, of bikers, so they do yeah. talk. Um, but that, does that extend, Nick? Do you think that that applies, that the conversation can bring results? Uh, no, I think it can. Um, uh, I think the points trying to make are spot on. Um, I think that we will never get to the place that price is not the, the, the key final um, hurdle in making a, a decision, but reputation and recommendation are the, uh, you know, the essential elements of a brand. And you know, if you're, you're building a brand that has value with your, your audience, your consumer, then um, social media is a key, a, a key channel to do so. Of course, price is such an important thing for the search, particularly things like home insurance um, and car insurance, for example. So can, can this shift the balance from price to the brand? I think it's always an equation. Always has been an equation and, and always will be. Um, people will not pay what they don't consider to be value yeah. for, um, for a product or a service. They will um, take the recommendations for, from others, though, as to um, how that equation sits in their own minds. And I think that um, recommendation, particularly in the social environment, is something that we've always lived with, but now, of course, it's just so big. You know, the yeah. scale and immediacy of of recommendation through social media is just uh, phenomenal. Well, um, the trend isn't just confined to purely personal lines alone, with 96% of commercial lines insurers and 93% of London markets also expe expecting to see most of their uh, customers searching for reviews online in the next five years. Um, you know, how does it, do you think, adapt or, or transfer to commercial lines insurance? Is it just business to customer? Um, I, I think when you look at businesses in the UK, the vast majority are SMEs, you know, small, medium enterprises, and you know, within that, the, the largest proportion are you know, the smaller end. Yeah. And if you look at trends, there's not a great deal of difference between um, the way that people see SME uh, purchase of insurance going and personal lines. I think there's a bit of a lag. Um, but you know, small business owners, small business employees, mm. um, they're using social media. And therefore, what I think we need to do is we need to be ready for it. It might be, um, like I say, a little behind personal lines, but that, that gives the commercial players mm. an advantage, you could argue, because um, we can prepare ourselves, begin mm. to build a presence and a strategy, um, whilst looking and learning from yeah. our personal lines colleagues. Tracking, monitoring, keeping an idea of who's, who's buying what or who wants to buy what, that's really important. How can you do that? Absolutely. So we don't have a formal tracking process in place in terms of Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, etc., although we are on them daily. Um, but what we do find is they're a great indicator for general satisfaction amongst our consumers and our products. So the key, any issues that are being raised on Facebook, when the brand tracking or the phones are ringing, pretty much the same things are correlating around what people are saying about mm. the brand. Yeah. Uh, Innovation is one of these points that it would be, wouldn't it be lovely if, if products could be innovated by the customer and suddenly you've got a, a great source of information and that leads to new business products. Uh, Nick, can that happen? Does it happen? It, absolutely it does. Um, I think that's one of the most exciting things we've discovered around social media is you know, crowdsourced innovation. And you know, we first saw it with user-generated content around brands and a wonderful example of Old Spice that... Um, the, the, the commercial went viral, but so did everybody else's versions of the commercial. <laughs> and um, we're now finding that there are um, organisations that are actively developing products with the, with the consumer, not, for, not mm. for the consumer, with the consumer in mind, but actually with the consumer. Yeah. And uh, you know, we're even seeing this in financial services with Barclays doing a student product and um, uh, HSBC doing an, uh, a small business product that is um, designed and um, developed and continues to develop um, mm. with, with the user. Very exciting. Really exciting, and, and many insurers, of course, now, as we've heard, are investing or planning to invest in building their digital marketing capabilities to attract customers through sites such as Facebook. But traditionally, insurance companies have suffered from poor public perception, haven't they? Particularly when the product is seen as a, a grudge purchase like car insurance. So besides the use of meerkats and opera singers, we all love those, what techniques can insurers use to build a better public image and conversation with customers using social media? Now, let's start with you, Hannah. You know, you've had some successes, haven't you, at Bennett's. Tell us, how, how did that work through? Absolutely. So we've taken a multi-channel approach. I think it's important for anybody thinking about going into social media that they don't just see it as a bolt-on. It has to totally complement um, what you're doing with the rest of your marketing as well. Um, part of our multi-channel activity was around getting down on the ground with the bikers, going to events, track mm. days, etc., and talking to them through that, whilst complementing it with regularly updated and engaging content on the social media channels. And mm. through that, we've been able to half our direct marketing budget from the more expensive channels such as print advertising because mm. people are coming on the social networks where we are um, and we've actually seen record sales as a result. D do other channels feed into the social media? You know, for, for instance, if you have a, a campaign somewhere else, does that say 
find out more on Facebook. Totally. I challenge anybody to find a piece of Bennett's advertising that doesn't have the links to our Facebook, um, yeah. YouTube and Twitter. Chaps, what, what do you think about that? That, that, that feeding in, that multi-channel approach? It is really a multi-channel approach where everything feeds through everything else, if you like. Go on, you go. OK, well, no, I, I think it's essentially it's joined up and, and yeah. part of um, yeah, the bigger picture, I think. Uh, you, you do need to establish what you want to achieve in terms of you know, um, getting across brand values, brand perception, who you want to communicate with. Um, and, and don't just get excited because social media is a new shiny toy. Yeah. I think it's incredibly important. It's really important. But you've got to understand the different... Uh, routes to communicate with you know, customers yeah. and customers if you're writing direct or intermediaries. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're a largely intermediated organisation. How do brokers want to communicate with us and make sure it's, it's all joined up and the, there are no gaps? Already you're taking control over social media. Well, let's turn to you again now and just ask you another poll question. Uh, you can see the next question uh, submitted by John Davis at Aviva on the right-hand side of your screen. You can vote there too. Question is... Given that insurance is a, is a one-off transactional purchase, usually price-driven at the moment, is it realistic to expect a significant level of customer interaction via social media channels? Easier answer this time. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Three, not quite sure. We'll look at that in just a second. Vote now, just here, and we'll put your views to the panel in just a moment's time. What can we learn from other industries, Nick? You know, uh, other, other sectors of insurance, for example? I mean, David's making a great point about how actually... Um I think social media is, has not changed the fundamental principles of what we do, but it's just accelerated them. So any organisation engages with the customer um, through all of their touch points. And um, social media just creates a, um, the, the opportunity to be found out slightly more quickly if you're inconsistent. And uh, I hesitate to use the word dishonest, but slightly less than transparent. And I think that there is a um, uh, the most... Uh, prevalent change will be the tone of voice with which we need to engage with those um, those people who are our customers or our end consumers. And um, uh, we must think about our marketing effort with a with a small M as a, as a business because we touch the customer at every point, and that's the opportunity to change, to create value. Mm. And social media is an integral part of that. Um, of course, when you're marketing to a wide audience and it's public. There are risks involved. I mean, what happens when things go wrong? Do you have to have a crisis management policy uh, strategy in place? Um, from a Bennett's perspective, we've actually been caught out on this. Um, we had an issue last November um, around, it was actually about our modifications policy. Um, and naturally, it's Facebook where people come to, to vent their frustrations and to ask questions. Yeah. But again, the positives is that we can be on there putting what is factually correct. I think there was a lot of confusion around um, that instance. Um, so we could be on our Facebook, be factually correct, the people are coming there with a disgruntlement, but they can actually see, oh, maybe it wasn't as, as was written in a certain article at the time. So it, it can be both positive and negative, even in, in a time that may look like an issue, but certainly for us, we're caught by surprise and we'll be a lot more prepared next time. Hopefully there won't be a next time. Well, absolutely. There's bound to be, but you can deal with it. Um, great. Thanks for the uh, answers to the poll question. The question was, is it realistic to expect a significant level of customer interaction via social media channels the answer the questions were the options were yes no not sure the answers are yes 61 percent which is great uh, no 14 percent which is very small in comparison not sure 25 percent so a quarter aren't quite sure of course there are complexities in there thanks very much what do you think about that david uh, I, I'm pleased that people say uh, that there's going to be um, a great degree of, of interaction. I think the other aspect is we won't necessarily know the interaction that's going on. I don't think it just means you know, a, a communication between you know, the customer and the company. I think you know, the um, talking about products, product content, pricing, mm -hmm. recommendations, problems, issues, that can go on yeah. um, outside of a, you know, that, that direct link and therefore we need to be looking at that as well. Yeah. But going back to the... the line of um, conversation um, a couple of minutes ago around reputation and you know how you mantle, manage disaster I think that the, the the wonderful thing of course is that people are going to be talking about you even if you're not talking to them no. yeah. um, so you you this is you know this is the world of conversation out there in social media if you do something as an organization that's inappropriate if you find yourself um, misserving um, a, a customer or client then they will start talking about it yeah. we we used to say in customer service the old adage of for every one um, positive mention, we'll get 10 complaints. And now you look at the data around who's saying what in social media, and there are 20% approximately um, from the global survey that we've done around consumers who are saying um, highly negative things mm. around 
uh, brands and organisations. But there's also 20%, approximately, who's saying highly positive things. And there's this polarisation um, of conversation around brands. And, you know, you never, you never go to a restaurant and say, I've had an average meal. No. You go, it was terrible or it was brilliant. And... It's, it's a vocal minority, isn't it? Yep. At the moment, yeah. at the moment, but not, not to be in the future, possibly. Um, well, just on the next point, I think when we had our issue, we had more bikers coming on actually supporting us mm. um, against negative comments. I think that's really, really important as well. As long as you've got that legacy of having a great brand and a great reputation, you can certainly overcome short-term issues very, very quickly through social media. Excellent. Well, let's, let's just uh, move on quickly to uh, uh, servicing policies and, and how to effectively manage the relationship with the customer. We've touched on it just there. Social media does allow insurers to interact and communicate with customers and vice versa. That way they learn more about their customers' needs, help to educate them about the, uh, the best policies and the benefits of their current policies and deal with queries and complaints. David, um, of course, we've, we've already heard it's very clear. Insurance companies need to listen. AXA has a Twi Twi Twitter account, you know. How does it work? Is it, is it being used? Um, yeah, as, as I probably hinted at earlier mm. on, um, you, you can dabble in yeah. social media, and, and we decided we wanted a presence, we wanted to experience it. So, you know, first of all, we set up at AXA Commercial. Mm. Um, I think somebody in marketing set it up, and it, it was frankly, it was quite dull. Yeah. Um, there were some interesting, useful things posted from time to time, web links, things like that. Um, and we just decided that to get people interested, you, you've got to have a bit more... Um, of, you know, there's, there's got to be some character there. Um, yeah, and it's, it's got to, to express your brand values, but people have got to warm to it, where so just clinical um, relaying of information wasn't doing the trick. So um, myself and a couple of others tried to do that by, um, you know, adding our, our own emotion, I suppose, and that, that seems to have worked quite well. Very good point. It's a social medium, isn't it? It's a social medium. Of course it is. Um, but that's that's it's the term is used often. You you have a Twitter account at Bennett's and uh, and you have fifteen hundred followers. Uh, how do you manage that? How do you how do you deal with people? Because you need to personalise it in some way, as David's hinted to. We only use Twitter um, generally for very up to the minute results. So it might be race results, it might be that we're in an event, um, we'll tweet, you know, James Tozen's going to be on our stand in 10 minutes and you can just see the people flock um, towards our exhibition. So we use it very much for real-time communications as opposed to a more strategic, longer-term view of which we'll use the likes of Facebook, Google Plus and, and YouTube for. As we've heard in many different areas of the world, uh, Twitter can be a dangerous thing to, to use wrongly. If complaints turn up, they could be quite pointed in 140 characters. How do you deal with those? How do you deal with these? Well, I think in the same way that you would in the in the offline world, um, but quicker. Um, you uh, the expectation of service delivery in in social media is far greater. And you know, if you think about when um, uh, you wrote a letter, you might expect an answer back in a week. When you wrote an email, you might expect an answer back in twenty four hours. Yeah. And now it's minutes. So um, you need to find a way of uh, listening to um, the uh, the chatter out there, which um, may be creating your Facebook or, or Twitter. Account, but it may also be creating um, uh, an onboard medium where you create a forum like Direct Line have, um, sorry, mm. um, First Direct have, forgive mm. me, uh, to capture and manage customer conversations around complaints and information. And you know, to your point, you needed to make it interesting. Uh, and personalise it. Yeah. Uh, the people yeah. need to come, mm. and absolutely, this is a one to one dialogue, mm. and that requires um, effort and resource. Of course, people, people are, are not in a group of people watching telly at, at night, they're, they're sitting by the computer by themselves or on their uh, mobile device. Uh, and so, you know, does, that, does this have a great opportunity in your creating a lot more customer touch points? You know, rather than just going to the insurance company for renewing a policy once a year or so on, they can talk to you. Absolutely. It is phenomenally beneficial for us as a brand. I mean, I do think we have a benefit in that we have almost like a tribal audience uh, right. in each industry where they are passionate about what, what we're saying. Um, but we can literally have consumer touch points at any point throughout the year. And I think we're definitely not in the game of acquire a consumer in January and send them a renewal letter 11 months later. It's total engagement and about our brand being front of mind when it does come to the purchase point in their, in their life cycle. So there's an amplification so actually, if you think about the way that we engage with customers often through that journey, <laughs> as you said, it's acquisition, then it's renewal. Um, by creating a dialogue, you are much more likely to improve the, uh, the chances of renewal. Um, you are much more likely to, to learn and manage them through some of the issues around claimants, for example. Mm -hmm. So there are things that you can do um, that amplify your effectiveness through all aspects of the journey. So yeah. um, just more effective organisation, more effective customer delivery. That's right, and it really does filter through the company. It's, it's incredibly positive what you're saying. It, you, you have to be in the conversation for it to, to be a winner. 
But of course, we come back to compliance. You know, what can you say to people? What can you mm -hmm. take away and use from people? Well, to, to build on, on the previous comments first, I think it, it, there, there's a massive opportunity there because one of the big problems we have in insurance is you know, that lack of interaction with our customers. So you know, is it just once a year? Um, well, if you talk about you know, the claims process, it's even worse. You know, only 10 to 15 percent of your customers will have a claim in the year. So, when you're talking about trying to get them to adopt you know, new approaches, mm -hmm. information, technology, it's very, very difficult. It's not like a bank where you know you can have online banking because you're visiting your bank account, um, you know, a couple of times a week, that sort of thing. So, there's a massive opportunity. That, that we need to take advantage of. The issue is, though, that we are a highly regulated uh, industry and our habit isn't one of rapid response, immediate answers. It is one of, right, OK, we're going to think about this. You know, we have complicated policy wordings with, you know, crafted uh, endorsements that have been tested at law, that sort of thing. So we'll go through that approach and then get it tested by risk and compliance to make sure that what we're saying is right and appropriate. And I, I think Nick's comment earlier about you, you it, it, they're an important part of the business. They're there for a very good reason, but you've got to make sure they're in the tent with you mm -hmm. rather than outside causing problems. And it is just part of the business, of course. Well. We've explored how insurers can uh, manage the customer relationship through social media. Now let's go into more detail on probably the most important interaction between insurer and customer, the claims handling process. Uh, many insurers are building and piloting new ways to use social media to communicate with or deliver information on policy, to policyholders and uh, claims handlers. The accessibility, reach, and most importantly, the immediacy of channels like Twitter provide obvious benefits. Well, we've talked about this already, David, in some ways, but... Do you think the spread of information, of useful information, and when you do get a handle on it, can actually reduce the number of claims? Because you're having that conversation, it's a more supportive relationship. Uh, I, I think the, the urgency and immediacy will help. Mm. So if you take some, like, you know, a flood situation, um, you know, posting somebody out a note telling them to buy some sandbags, you know, it arrives a week after, you know, the waters have engulfed their properties, you know. Um, so... Uh, Useful for the garden wall. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, potentially. Yeah. Um, so I think that immediacy will help. I also think in terms of, um, you know, ju just trying to build that relationship so that people do see the insurer as, as a provider of advice rather than just delivery on a promise. Yeah. Um, the negative, however, is that we do know that in, in certain circumstances, um, through forums like Money Saving Expert, for instance, yeah, yeah. you can go on and um, they will tell you how to make money from complaining, for instance, and things mm. like that. Um, when there's an opportunity for um, money to be made from an insurance policy, you can guarantee that that will be one of the things that it spreads uh, mm. around the networks like Wild Farm. Yeah. A lot of nodding from the, the panel here. Uh, do you agree with that? Yeah, um, I, very much so. I think that um, at the top end of the conversation, we were talking about the change to um, the, the enterprise yeah. and talking a little about the social enterprise. I think that the, the, the desire for organisations to slow down process just can't happen in a world where social media is dominant. Yeah. Um, you have to have thought through um, uh, how you can warn, pre-warn, mm -hmm. um, how you can manage, how you can use it as a communi communication tool with, with fantastic levels of immediacy. Mm. Um, but also as a business you have to be much more transparent, agile and responsive. So in the world of claims, yeah. what does that mean to the processes that you've applied historically? Clearly, of course, you know, what we're looking at, people here have already in the in earlier poll said acquisition, the sales, what, what they think social media is all about. Of course, there's, there's money involved, there are, there are, there are, there's a business factors involved. But there seems to be a clear benefit, Hannah, doesn't there, in, in terms of having that conversation and supporting, perhaps in terms of claims handling, it might reduce, you know, bring them away from the cliff, if you like. Yeah, and certainly in terms of customer service costs as well, I think there's a benefit. So our um, formal complaints are down 65% um, following not just our, our social media um, mm. aspects, but certainly if somebody is disgruntled, they'll come straight to Facebook and we can deal with it immediately. So it does actually help so to, to, deal with things, to deal with them efficiently and quickly as well? Absolutely. So that's not ending up in, in a more um, mm. lengthy process of letter writing, etc., via the, the call centres as well. Mm. Well, um, We've heard about the positive effects, uh, impact of the dissemination of information through channels such as Twitter, but what about the potentially damaging consequences? Um, David, you know, are you seeing an increasing fraudulent claims in a bit of fraud, for example, because once you have that information, perhaps you've had access to, you know, where to pitch your claim. Yeah, uh, that, there's, there's two aspects, as I've already touched on. Um, people like opportunities to make money mm. and therefore saying, you know, this is a way round 
you know, a particular uh, you know, process. Uh, but also if you think, without giving too much away, when there's a major weather event, for mm -hmm. instance, insurers will change their processes and change their checks and yeah. maybe will be you know, um, just making instant payouts up to a certain value. Mm -hmm. Now, you imagine if that goes around... Um, uh, you know, Twitter, Facebook, that, you know, acts are suddenly, you know, not asking for any invoices, not really checking claims below a certain figure. Somebody maybe was going to put in a claim for £500. If they know the limit is £2,000, then amazingly, mm. in some circumstances, you know, the value of the claim will get to um, you know, ju just under that cut-off point. Mm. So I think you've got to be alive to it. We've not really experienced it yet f in terms of social media, other than seeing postings on things like money saving expert mm. but I think we need to we need to continue to um, be flexible when you get into a surge event because otherwise we won't cope otherwise mm. you know, the service that we provide to our customers will suffer yeah. but we need to do it in a manner whereby you know the risks of, of social media increasing fraud uh, are taken into account. So Nick do you think that's, that's, that's like the upper limit of how transparent you can be or is it a case of it's a two-way street so that you give information that's all very good but you also can pick up what they're up to and you can also substantiate claims perhaps through the use of social media. Yeah, no, information, it's being done. information goes both ways of course and you get a sense of what's happening in the market and how consumer groups um, might respond even if it's inappropriate in their choice of response. Yeah. Um, I, I think that um, it's about being having thought through the, the process. Mm. So, so if you know that you're going to experience a surge event, well, what are you going to say publicly? And you, mm. do, the, you do the same uh, in the offline world, you just might have to do it a little quicker. Data is really important. I mean, you know, monitoring, yeah. we mentioned about monitoring earlier on, didn't we, Hannah? Mm -hmm. Keeping track of people uh, is really important. You have the, the data, even though anecdotal sometimes, will now be available through different channels. So is it, again, keeping an eye on what people are up to, what's obviously the discussions going on? And putting, putting a real a size and a figure on that and saying, that's where we need to go, that's what we need to look at, these are the risks we're open to. Yeah, we're constantly taking feedback from all of our social media about what people are looking for, what, how we should be evolving products, offerings, customer service, etc. Um, but I wouldn't say we've taken any different data approach as such in terms of utilising any incremental data we may have got from social media. That's not come into the mix at this point. Okay. From our perspective, it's the, the first piece of advice we, we try and help our clients navigate is um, you know, where, where are they listening? <laughs> Who are they listening to? What, what's their sentiment, sentiment monitoring look like? So the, you, you get one, one version of the truth and you work out where the materiality of conversation yeah. is taking place and you, you, know, um, you know how to react to it. Um, yeah. if, you, if you're not listening, if you're not joined up in the manner in which you're listening, you can't respond. OK, well, uh, we've examined how social media can be used to improve communication with customers. Uh, I want to shift the, the emphasis a bit now to the application of social media for internal communications and connecting with suppliers as well. Uh, that centres largely on the use of internal social networks to communicate across business functions, share information within the company and create communities of expertise. Uh, Nick, in your experience, you know, how are companies doing this to, to engage employees to get that line of communication? Also, to... to it's very important to know what your, organi what your organization is talking about behind closed doors. Yeah, um, yeah an interesting one here. The, 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 I mean, the, there are many tools. You know, Accenture has Yammer, and um, many organizations use Chatter. Yeah. Um, but uh, in the same way that when you're talking to a consumer, you have to change your cho tone of voice, you have to do that when, you, when you're um, talking internally. You have mm. to accept that there's a degree of honesty and allow it to play out needs to take place, otherwise mm. it's, it's not a channel um, that will work for you in the same way that it isn't externally. And your employees, surely, your team aren't going to talk about things that they really feel in their, in their innermost heart if it's going to get them in trouble. So clearly you need to take the bad as well as the good. Yeah, you do. You have to, you, as I say, your attitude needs to change right. around um, uh, what, what you allow to, to happen. And, you know, there are many organisations that still don't allow their, their staff yeah. to, to use Facebook or yeah. Twitter while they're on their, their work device, which surely is not yeah. an organisation that is um, uh, looking to social media as a way of um, mm. creating a change for their business. Um, but you know all the old stuff. You know staff um, suggestion schemes. You know, getting feedback from the front line, mm. um, getting a barometer for how the organisation is thinking and feeling are, are yeah. far more easily facilitated and more more yeah. quickly facilitated through social media. Social how, media. how about business to business, um, David? You know, obviously we talked about consumers yeah. a lot, but but to suppliers and to you know larger businesses, for yeah. example, how, does it work? Um, does it give a personal face to your business, for example? We see a lot of 
comments about our suppliers yeah. through social media because, you know, as has already been commented, if it's very good service or very poor service, people will want to, to, to talk about it. Um, but again, being completely honest, um, you don't want the detail of sorting out the problems mm. to be too public. No. And therefore, I think you've got to be very clear that you know, public social media no. um, isn't good for um, every issue. In, in terms of our own staff, we do things um, quite well. We've got something called Our Space. We have regular forums. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the key point is you have to make sure you, you allow people to be yeah. um, as open as possible, which does mean to say you're going to get some criticism from time to time. And you mustn't. You mustn't come down hard. Yeah. Now, again, if you've got a supplier and you're interacting with a supplier, if something's going wrong, inevitably there'll be a contractual element to it. Mm -hmm. So at this point in time, I think you've got to be alive to the fact that people are communicating using social media more and more, mm -hmm. um, but from a supplier, I would rather pick up the phone and, yeah. and use your good old-fashioned good old fashioned social media, yes, the phone. Um, rather than yeah. the, the new technology, because I think that might be one of the few occasions where you know, you're just better. Mm. Um, and, and, and the other thing is in terms of, um, I read something the other day which, which talked about you know, uh, in person, on the telephone, yeah. your video, whatever, um, humour, irony, things like that comes across. It's very, very difficult in the printed form. And when you're talking you know, Twitter, for instance, 140 characters, yeah. you can really, really miss the point. So again, it's about understanding where social media can add and where it, it won't provide you benefit. Um, well, let's uh, ask you your opinion once more uh, and uh, conduct another quick live poll. Again, you can find this on the right-hand side of your screen just down there. The question, uh, do you think the use of social media as an internal business tool is a fad or a fixture? Number one, fad or B, fixture, C, not sure. Is it just a fly-by-night idea or is it here to stay? Um, let's just talk between, between uh, finding out your answers uh, and, and now, Hannah, you know, what about recruitment? How do we get people involved from insurance? You know, surely we're all our own social media expert in some ways, if, if we're on there. So how do you get people to, to listen to you and think, well, think that's the place I'd like to work? Um, certainly in terms of again benefiting from our, our passionate audience is that we absolutely reflect a brand we don't see ourselves as an insurance brand we see ourselves as a bike brand at the end of the day yeah. and it's the content that we're putting onto face um facebook and youtube and twitter that endorses that as well and makes people think actually these guys are really into the biking aspects yeah. um, and yes i've got financial services experience so i've got the product knowledge but i'd love to work for them as a brand because of what they're doing in the industry of course you know if you're in the insurance industry you've already been there at some company or other so perhaps you can see through the the promotional activity and actually you can see the truth well, if there's an honesty you might get that i mean i always love playing the game when i'm presenting to an audience you know how many people are here on um uh, twitter and you know tenth of the audience put up their hands, how many yeah. people are using Facebook and you get 60% and how many people are using LinkedIn and you know almost 100% and everybody's looking after their careers. Yeah. Yeah. You know, LinkedIn is the, the social media platform for, for recruitment and yeah. for career management and, and you know, frankly we are now in a place where we are giving up our data in a way that we never did before and you know, I often try and encourage my teenage daughter not to post those pictures on Facebook because you know, employers will be starting to trawl social media to make assessments of candidates. So it's not just a proactive tool mm. um, and there are software packages that you can use, for example, in conjunction with LinkedIn to help profile or, or recommend the right people, yeah. but it's also it's a you know, reactive negative tool about screening um, potential candidates. So, it, yeah. you know, Again, whole new world, speak. whole yeah. new world. Uh, you've been very, this is the great thing about doing a social media webinar, is that you're very, very fast. Thanks for your answers on the poll. The question was, do you think that the use of social media as an internal business tool uh, is a fad or a fixture? A said 18%. There are still 18% of people thinking it's a fad, but fine. 63% uh, think it's a fixture, so we're here to stay. That's, that's two-thirds. And 19% aren't sure. OK, so we've got equals for the yes and the not sure. Would you expect that, uh, David? Is that what you... Um, no, I'm, I'm very pleased to see that. I thought there would be more going for the fad because it, it's still relatively in its infancy. Mm. Um, I, I absolutely agree with the uh, majority of, of people who voted there, though, because... You know, if you just see how Facebook, Twitter is is dominating these days, you know, I think um, you know old-fashioned things like like newspapers are mm. under threat because people are are constantly using social media, yeah. uh, and and therefore now I think they've got it spot on. And and my view would be to get that proportion saying um, you know things positively when it's still in its infancy is a really really good sign for our industry.
There are many shapes to any internal social media platform, so the idea, it's fair enough to say it's here in some form, isn't it, Nick? Uh, it's not a fad, it's a phenomenon. You a know, phenomenon, A phenomenon, right. try saying that one now. Um, <laughs> it doesn't fit, we have, we have Fs, not PHs here. There you go, very good. very good. Yeah. Um, you know, if you look at um, organisations that are embracing social media, they are gaining competitive advantage. Yeah. The you know the power of analytics, the power of the digital channels, the, the power of changing the the manner in which they're choosing to engage with their customers, kind of the whole tone of voice transparency thing, is changing their economic relationship with their yeah. customers. And it's just you know Best Buy, Zappos, Starbucks. These are organisations that are using it as part of all aspects of their delivery across the organisation. And you know frankly, it's more than just here to stay. It's it, you know if you don't embrace it, you are going to get left behind. Your questions in a second, but finally, Hannah, what do you think? It's here to stay? Absolutely, I do think that. Um, so BGR Group is very people-focused, and we have a very strong intranet site, which brings all stuff yeah. together. So we don't actually have a bespoke social media piece for BGR, but what we do find is that we have a lot of employees who are on, say, um, Alexander Orloff, because we've compared the market, and Bennett's Facebook pages and other brands, simply because they like w what the company's doing. Well, we've looked at the use of social media across the entire insurance value chain, and, and I think we've, we've had some really interesting insights into how insurers are using social media at the moment. Uh, social media will obviously be a key consideration for the insurance industry in the, in the future, and there'll need to be investment to work, investment in time or money to invest with customers changing behaviour and expectations. Hopefully you've found the discussion useful so far, and clearly social media doesn't uh, suit one company in exactly the same way as the other. But now it's your opportunity to put your questions to panellists direct, and you can and still ask your questions, uh, either related to the topics we covered or if you uh, feel there's something we haven't covered yet, uh, please do let us know. But let's go straight to the question. We've had some sent in here and through my screen, so let's go here first of all. This is from James at uh, Heartland Insurance Brokers. Uh, he says, I can see the benefit of this with high volume personal lines business, but how can this apply to brokers and their relationship with their business clients? We've touched on B2B, um, B B, haven't we? But it's a, it's a fair point. How, how does, how does the, the personal, I'm sat at my computer, social media translate to real business? An insurance broker has to recommend an insurance company. That's what they do. Um, and I think yeah, broking's not just about price. Yeah, obviously, it varies from, from class of business to class of business. But I, I think they've got to recommend mm. an insurer. Um, what do they know about the insurer? You know, I've already talked about the... You know, infrequent contacts that you know, the end customer has. It's, it's, it's not that different with um, a broker a lot of the time, and therefore, any way that we can get our message across, our values across, um, it, that's got to be a benefit. Mm -hmm. But also, you're sort of bringing it to life, you know, social media, the human element. I mean, I, I, I stumbled across um, a video on YouTube of our CEO, Amanda Blanc. Um, saying you know, why she thought it was great to work in insurance and access specifically. Mm -hmm. And that sort of brings the company to life and, and tells the insurance broker you know, a bit more about who they're recommending. So yes, it's maybe not as easy as, as um, if you're trying to get a simple message across on a, a volume personal lines product, but there's absolutely a place for it. Crucially, and I'm sure she was incredibly convincing, but it's do you believe that person interacting with you? That, that's the thing, isn't it, Nick? Yeah, um, we... Um, saw the same challenges around B2B versus B2C and um, uh, the most interesting thing is when you look at the pharmaceutical industry which is your classic you know recommender specifier you know um, uh, healthcare provider value chain and, and in, it's not dissimilar and actually um, the, the greatest role for social media uh, there is around the source of gathering and disseminating information and kind of the self-editing world of um, uh, how you um, provide information to a relatively small audience that's that's actually you know tough, mm. significantly detailed stuff that you you need the experts to understand and interpret for you. So um, uh, that's where I imagine that there is the greatest dialogue going mm -hmm. going on, and where um, the the intermediary businesses are most likely to engage first. Ali, you work in a, in a, in a particular sector with with the bikers who do talk, and they but they also re they've really taken to your you know, um, almost accidental interaction in social media. It just happened and, and then you responded. Do you think it applies? Do you think it moves over to, to the business-to-business sector? I think it does. I think the... Um 
issue we'd had was the um, growth that came so quickly, so mm. being able to manage that. But we certainly do have a lot of fans on Facebook than the manufacturers, so a lot more of our business relationships and our suppliers also um, endorsing what we do. And I think what's also important around the point of do you believe the view of somebody on Facebook? Belief must be important, trust know, must be important. Absolutely. It's about being independent and credible despite mm. being your own brand. So yeah. you'll rarely see Bennett's posting an opinion. Yeah. Um, but what we do encourage is we're bringing the bikers together through our activity on social media yeah. for them to together voice their opinions into form of you. One to my, my screen here, this is from uh, Carl Bedlow, who's MD of Personal Lines at Zurich Insurance Group. Uh, what's the cost of developing something meaningful in the social media space? Now, that's a question. What's the cost? We've mentioned investment. We've talked about cost in some way. But um, I'll, to the panel, you know, what is the true cost? Uh, we're not going to talk about reputation, maybe. The cost of developing something meaningful and something that's rubbish is exactly the same. Um, <laughs> that's a good point. That's a very good point. You yeah. Know. yeah. Um, it, it's, it depends on what you want, want to yeah. do. And um, we, we see many organisations experimenting so they can kind of feel it and, yeah. and, and uh, learn around the, um, uh, the how, you know, lots of the how stuff. Um, I think that when you've done a bit of that, and that doesn't have to be expensive, and frankly, for Zurich, it's, it would be the, you know, the tip of the iceberg. Um, it's when you then translate that into a proper strategy and you're asking the why questions, where you have your metrics in place and you're, you're seeing, um, uh, you, you've determined what you're doing this for, that's when the real question of, of how much yeah. should apply. Uh, we've been tweeted. Thanks very much indeed for that. This is from uh, Zurich. Keith, actually, it's somebody else, I guess, from Zurich, actually. Um, I fully agree with at AXA David W, that's you, about adding uh, character to social media. Uh, we know media customers want personal touch. Uh, thanks very much for that. That's a, that's a point you've made. Uh, not a question so much, but, yeah, I mean, this seems to be coming through very clearly. Um, okay, another one from here. This is um, from uh, R. Lee. And uh, just how much personality can you demonstrate uh, offering legislative or risk management advice uh, via SM to commercial clients? Uh, personal lines, fine. I can see some benefit, but I'm struggling with commercial. I would, however, love somebody to show me where I'm going wrong. Now, we don't have to demonstrate how much personality that you need to put into uh, that, that relationship, but, you know, where's the, where's the limit? Is there a limit? Uh, I, I, I think, strangely, you, you can put more personality into B2B because, mm. you know, you, again, we sadly come back to the regulatory side. Um, there's, there's so much control that has to go in to personal lines direct customer communication, that that can, if you're not careful, limit uh, you know, the, the, the feeling that you're yeah. trying to get across. But yeah, when you're talking B2B, you, know, you are talking about entities at a similar level speaking. There's, 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 um, it, it's anticipated that there's a greater degree of understanding on both sides. But I just think, you know, r rather than trying to sort of um, you know, measure it in some way. I think it's just the obvious aspects that what we're talking about are new forms of communication yeah. which are just so much more emotive than an all printed leaflet which you know just goes in the bin maybe. It does come down to the tone that you were mentioning earlier on. There is a tone and every client, every company will be different and in fact doesn't that create a, almost like your specialism, your USP is the way you come across? Yeah, it's spot on. I mean you right. think about the debates we used to have in customer service delivery. Do we write Write or answer the phone, Nick or Mr. Smith. You know, yeah. I mean that that's not an evidence of whether you've got a personality or not. Um, uh, it is exa exactly around the tone of voice and language and speed of response. It's the things that you yeah. do, and you know, this is a conversation. This is not printed literature. Yeah. You have to have um, the confidence yeah. to use it appropriately and um, to be. You know, people want you to be adult to adult, yeah. but um, they want you to be honest and transparent and. Yeah. You know, all the things that mean that you're dealing with them in the way that they wish to be dealt with. Dealt with. One more from my screen here. This is from Hannah Poulton, uh, marketing at Friends Life. Um, the question is, do you think that social media can ever be fully effective in heavy regulated industries where uh, regulations on sign-off make it difficult to move quickly and communicate in real time? Yeah, we've talked about regulation. It's really important, this, this compliance regulation thing. Hannah, what do you think, you know, about that question? It's... Uh Really, really interesting debate. I mean, on our Twitter feed, if we're in an event, we have to get the stuff out instantly. If yeah. someone's, you know, if there's something happening in a race, we need to be on it. Yeah. Um, there's never going to be an instance where that can go through compliance. Yeah. Um, we have the benefit where, obviously, that is about bike-related activity. Yeah. It's not necessarily about insurance, but I do think with regulation, um, I'm sure it will come into social media, and I think it would be a, mm. an awful travesty if it meant that a lot of these comms that people are getting out in real time had to be reduced because we had to take a more compliant view in social media as well.
We have one more question. We have very little time to say it, but if you can wrap it up very quickly. The insurance industry has historically been characterised by a total lack of transparency vis-à-vis -vis the customer. Can the panel comment on potential disruptive entrants to the insurance market who can leverage the current industry lack of transparency? Look, um, yeah, can you, can you see people coming in to change the mood? Uh, I, I think suddenly social media makes everything more transparent, potentially. Um, and yes, if new players come in who are more switched on uh, and take advantage and we don't, mm. then we're going to have an issue. But uh, my suggestion would be that we, we don't wait for new players to come in and take advantage. You know, we have people um, that you know, have the skills, have the experience, so you know, we make sure that we're ready and we're ahead of the game. Great. Well, it's been a fascinating webinar and discussion. Perhaps I can just turn to our panellists one more time uh, for a few final words or thoughts on the key messages they'd like uh, you to take away from the webinar. Well, let's start with, uh, with Hannah, if you don't mind. You know, what do you think are the key things that, from now, the insurance industry can do that maybe it hasn't been doing already? I think if people are thinking about going into social media, and a lot of insurance companies are on that kind of precipice of, shall we go for it or not, just making sure that it absolutely complements what you're doing in other channels as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be a mistake to avoid it altogether, um, but it's also a mistake just to do because everybody else is. So mm -hmm. if you're going to start on this road, make sure you can keep up with the regular, regular time and engaging content piece, otherwise it just won't be a success. It's, it's, not a, it's not a reinvention, is it? It's not a complete change. It's actually adapting. Is that right, Nick? Yeah, um, have a go, think it through, build a plan, do some listening, yeah. um, measure and um, make sure that you're clear why you're doing it and make sure the organisation understands and align across the, the, the various functions within the business. Um, mm -hmm. It's like anything, you know, you, you, you get everybody in the same place and it's amazing what you can do. Yeah, and you have them there, they're, they're there already, as are your staff. So we have some experts in-house already. Uh, you know, David, what do you think? What, what are the key things you think people should take away? I think... Uh, People should uh, embrace social media, um, but be really clear about what you stand for as a company, what you want to achieve, and make sure that every communication um, supports that. You know, mm -hmm. the, it, it, you know the, the brand, if you want to call it the brand, or you know, the, I, I would yeah, refer to the, you know, the core values, you know, the things that you stand for, make sure they come across and make sure it's all part of a, you know, a, a joined up multi-channel approach. One final thing we did hear about in the earlier poll about acquisition, about sales being this, this key point that people believe it is. What do you think it is? I'll ask Nick finally, what do you think it is that, that social media represents for the insurance industry? I, I think that actually as, a, as, a, um, as an opportunity for the industry, it's, a, it's potentially a catalyst for thinking differently about the things that the, the business has already uh, always done. Um, it, it throws up new opportunities in a number of different play, places. So looking internally at how you engage with your, your staff, particularly at the front line, and how you capture ideas and uh, you, you, you improve understanding and engagement, um, and, and many of the same principles to customers too, but you know, looking to new pricing models in product innovation, um, looking to uh, brand engagement and making all of your channels of um, customer uh, delivery more effective mm. um, and uh, looking to deliver a, a, a completely new approach to service um, and all of these things can be done and reduce cost I think that's the point it's cheaper um, this is not a, an expensive newfangled thing um, for people with open toe sandals and long hair mm. this is something like that, us like yeah. us yeah. this yeah. is something that you know proper big business yeah. should be thinking through. Well, we do hope you've uh, all enjoyed the past hour. Thank you also to everybody who's uh, sent in your questions. Our apologies we didn't have time to get through to all of them. Isn't that always the way, especially on a webinar like this? Clearly, social media offers uh, some great opportunities for the insurance industry, and there are exciting times ahead with lots of scope for innovation, as Nick just spoke about. Well, you know, as we continue talking about this over the next few weeks, we hope you'll join us at Market Forces Social Media in Financial Services Conference next month to discuss the issues in a bit more detail. It's a one-day conference on March 27th with speakers including representatives of LV, uh, Cooperative uh, Financial Services, Santander, Barclays and Unum. And you can find out more on our website, www.marketforce.eu.com, in a very tongue-in-cheek way. Thanks to the, the panel and, of course, uh, uh, to the uh, CII and Accenture for supporting today's webinar. Fantastic. And, of course, uh, to you for watching. We hope to see you at our next event. Until then, take care. All the best.